Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Boston Virtual ARTCC's IFR Clearances Ground School. Not to be fooled by the name, we actually cover quite a bit about IFR in this session, everything from how to pick the right routes to how to safely depart an airport when there's no tower online available. So I will, without further ado, pass you over to the two actual flight instructors in the channel, Krikor and Alec, and they will take you through IFR Clearances. All right. Good evening, guys. Uh, it's Craig Orr speaking here along with Alec. Today, we're going to talk about IFR clearances. And, and really, we're going to talk about clearances, but this kind of serves as a, a general introduction to instrument flight rules. So we're going to talk today um, about a number of things, right? We're going to talk about uh, planning IFR flights and some of the aspects that are, are required when you're planning a flight. We're going to talk about uh, departure procedures. There's a couple different types and different flavors that you can see them in, so we're going to talk about that today. Um, and we're going to get into the IFR clearance. So this is by no means a, a full guide to flying under IFR. There's a, a, a ton of different aspects, um, some of which are going to be covered in subsequent ground schools, but these are the uh, areas that we're going to talk about today. All right, so there are a couple uh, different components to playing on IFR flight the departure, the honor, and the arrival. We're going to focus on uh, the departure for today's session, but we're, but we're definitely going to cover the other two as well. The departure uh, usually involves a SID, which is a standard instrument departure, and ODP, which is an obstacle departure procedure. We're going to focus on those. We have the on route portion, of course, and then the arrival, which could j involve a star or a standard terminal arrival route. Uh, as a sim pilot, uh, you often have a wide variety of sources already available for flight planning. Um, BVA has a preferred routes page, which you can access through the website. FAA has a preferred route database, and then you can use FlightAware for statistics from real-world flights and pull those, uh, which are uh, flight routes used by actual aircraft flying the same route that you are. Um, that said, sometimes you cannot find a good route using those resources, and you have to just use your best judgment on SIDs and stars available. Um, you can't just whip up a SID say, eh, yeah, uh, we'll just pick this one, hope it works. Um, you should go out and see if it plans. Uh, you should plan it and see if it works in the direction that you're going. Um, and you can use resources like airways and MEAs, which are minimum honored altitudes, to provide obstacle clearance and radio reception. So long story short, if you don't have any good routes available, just use your best judgment. And obviously there's a whole... Go ahead, go ahead, Evan. No, go ahead. I was going to say that it's quite frequent that you may come up with a route that you think looks fantastic and air traffic control doesn't necessarily agree with you. And that happens quite frequently in real life. We'll see reroutes quite frequently. So with that being the case, I would recommend that if you are planning your flight when you've got your initial route, file your flight plan, but call for clearance before you do anything else, before you spend 10 minutes trying to go and set the airplane up and program your GPS and all that. To take a minute to actually call for the IFR clearance first. That way, if ATC does have a different route in mind and they're going to get an actual reroute, you haven't done the work of programming the whole airplane and that you have to redo it again. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point, Evan. And you see reroutes all the time in real world. I mean, just uh, about a week ago, Alec and I were flying a, a small airplane from Nashville to Boston, and we got probably three or four different reroutes over the course of four hours because even though the route that we filed looked great, ATC wanted something different. Uh, Joel Kraft asked a good question. He go, asked if the resources will turn up the same routes. And the answer is it depends. Sometimes they will. Uh, if it's a really common pairing like Boston and uh, New York's Kennedy Airport, you're probably going to get the same three or four routes and altitudes and aircraft types. If it's a longer trip, you may get different routes depending on where those sources obtain their information. Um, so it really depends on, on the flight and the source that you're using. Um, so today, like we mentioned, we're going to heavily focus upon departure procedures. Now, there are, are two primary types of departure procedures that we're going to talk about today, uh, which are obstacle departure procedures, or ODPs, and SIDS, which are standard instrument departures. Um, an ODP is something that is published for almost every airport, including a lot of untowered airports, and it provides a way to uh, as the name implies, remain clear from obstacles. Uh, even if you're departing an IMC and you're not able to see any of those obstacles, it's a way that you know you'll be clear of them. And it's a procedure that ATC knows that if you follow that, you're going to be clear of everything. So there's a couple different uh, places that you're able to find them. We're going to touch upon that in a minute. But here you can see an example of what an ODP looks like, both textually on the example here, as well as visually down here on the SARD 3 departure. And then over on the right, 
uh, is an example of a standard instrument departure. For example, in this case, the Bangor One departure. Um, and so we're going to get into a little bit of more detail on on both of these procedures here. So let's talk about ODPs. To fly an ODP, you don't need any sort of special air traffic control clearance. Um, and in the absence of an air traffic control clearance that conflicts with it, it's good practice to fly the ODP when departing an IMC. So it's a good practice to fly the departure procedure to avoid obstacles when you're in the clouds. Um, in the chart supplement, you'll find textual ODPs alongside the takeoff minimums if those apply to you. Uh, and graphic ODPs can be found in the terminal procedures or the TERPs. They're denoted with the phrase obstacle after the title, and we talked about both the chart supplement and the TERPs uh, last session. As far as locating an obstacle departure procedure, there's a couple of ways. The easiest way for a simulator pilot is on AirNav. Uh, AirNav.com is a pretty popular simulator resource. Uh, there's a, a direct link to them where the rest of the IFR charts are found. So you'll have a link for all of the instrument approaches and airport diagrams and all that fun stuff. Uh, and then here you'll see it'll list departure procedures, obstacles in brackets. Uh, so for example, the SARD-3 out of Aspen, Colorado is an example of an o ODP. Um, and then there's a link over to the right where you can download it. Now you're not always gonna find, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that it's fairly uncommon to find an ODP that has a, a name and a number similar to what you normally find with a conventional SID. Oftentimes you'll have an ODP for an airport, but it won't have any sort of identifier associated with it. That's, that's kind of specific to Aspen in this case. So, so is there, sorry, is there an ODP for every, every airport or just a few? That's a good question, Alan. Uh, there's not for every airport. And in fact, even with the airports, they're specific to the runway. So for example, the airport that I'm, uh, I, I fly out of most commonly is Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Mike Bravo Tango. And we have an obstacle departure procedure for runway 18, but we don't have anything for runway 36. So sometimes airports won't have one and sometimes they'll only have them for specific runways. Um, I could be mistaken on this, but my understanding is that's primarily based upon where the FAA determines there is a obstacle or terrain or something that affects a normal departure. Yeah, actually, I just read about this for writing one of the wings flights, and that's exactly what it is. So anytime there is a published instrument approach, so any kind of approach, an RNAV, an ILS, a VOR approach, anytime there's a published instrument approach into an airport, the FAA also does an assessment on the terrain for departures. And if there is a requirement to publish an ODP, that's when it'll get published. If a particular runway's departure path doesn't meet the requirements for an ODP because there isn't enough obstacle issues nearby, then you won't have an ODP published for that runway. Either way, you are still safe to depart. And in the case where there is no ODP, the FAA basically has determined that as long as you take off in accordance with the published takeoff minimums, which we'll talk about down the line, and you meet a couple requirements about your climb, you're safe to turn in any direction off that runway and you'll be able to avoid any obstacles. So as long as there's an instrument approach procedure, the FA has looked at the runways, and if there's no ODP, that means that you're safe to pretty much take off and turn wherever you want, with a couple exceptions we'll get to in a few slides. And there, there are standard departures uh, as far as things that you would do in the absence of an ODP. Um, and so that, that is what normally you get taught and what you should be doing. Um, so the other kind of departure that you most that you, that you see more commonly at larger airports is a standard instrument departure, which is often abbreviated as a SID. Um, it's a type of departure procedure. It's designed to do a couple things. It, it will provide clearance from obstacles or terrain, but it also is designed to help route traffic, um, which is why you generally find it at a larger or busier airport. Um, they're designed to help route traffic efficient, efficiently, excuse me, uh, mitigate noise. That's become a, a factor in recent years because people move near airports and then complain about the noise, because that makes sense. Uh, and it's also meant to provide obstacle and terrain clearance, which is obviously pretty essential. Um, an ATC clearance is required to fly a SID. If you don't receive a clearance from ATC, you can't go fly it. It's it's that simple. Um, they, in some cases, can be filed by the pilot, or in other cases, they can be assigned by ATC as part of your clearance, um, depending on the departure specifically or the airport. Um, and it's important to always read it back. Um, it's a part of an instrument clearance, which we're going to talk about here later in the session. Um, and if it's not read back, ATC has no way of knowing that you're actually going to follow it. So your read back of that portion of the clearance is you saying you're going to comply with the vertical and lateral requirements of that departure procedure. I just want to um, sort of interrupt, Alec. I just want to highlight that last point that Krikor made. We get this on VATSIM 
all the time, so it's really worth mentioning. Pilots will say, yes, I'm going to fly the Logan 2 departure. Yes, I'm going to fly the Sox 5 departure. They accept their clearance, they read it back, and then they blast off having no idea what the departure is and not complying with it. And at Boston, because of the way our airspace is constructed, pilots who don't fly the standard instrument departure off certain runways cause a real nightmare for us when it gets busy. So you think about an event like Tea Party that we had on Saturday. When a pilot departs off runway 22 right and they just fly straight out on runway heading instead of making the left turn that they're supposed to, they end up in a totally different controller's airspace. They end up affecting potentially a whole lineup of departures and arrivals. And it really creates a mess for us. So we're very happy if you say to us, I don't understand the departure. I don't have this departure. I can't fly this RNAV procedure. We'll just give you a heading and altitude and make it easy. But it's the pilots who say, yes, I can do this. I can fly this departure. And then it turns out that they're in the air having no idea what it is they've actually agreed to. So please make sure when you're thinking about a readback, you're not just repeating back to the controller the exact words they said you're also basically making a promise to them saying i can do these things and again if you're not sure not able not sure you're able just let us know and it's very easy for us to give you headings and altitudes instead absolutely thank you evan that's a very good point so is there is it odp and sid or odp or sid you normally won't fly both uh that's a great question by the way thank you for asking um, normally you won't fly both because they both provide terrain obstruction. So flying either one will guarantee you that, that clearance from terrain. Um, it really depends on the airport. So in a, at an airport like Boston Logan, for example, 99% of the time you're going to be assigned a SID from the clearance controller and you're going to be flying that SID. Even though there are published ODPs for Boston, you're almost never going to fly it because ATC wants you to fly a SID. At a smaller airport, maybe you're up in Rutland, Maine or Rutland, uh, is it Maine or Vermont? I think it's Vermont, actually. Right, yeah. Regardless, Rutland is Vermont, yeah. Thank you. So if you're at Rutland, Vermont, small untowered airport in the mountains up in Vermont, um, there's no air traffic control towers. So in that case, you'd, you'd be flying an ODP. And it, it's definitely or. You can't fly a SID and fly an ODP at the same time. Yes. Is there one that will take precedence over the other? Uh, mostly a SID, but that's predominantly because that's been assigned by ATC. Um, if you're assigned something by ATC, that overrides a SID, that overrides an ODP. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you get Thank a, you. You, you're very rarely ever get assigned an ODP. It, it is conceivable, but it really never happens. You will very frequently get assigned a SID. So the sort of hierarchy is if you get assigned a SID, you fly a SID. If you don't get assigned anything, you have the option to fly an ODP, and it's your choice if you do or you don't. Yeah, and that's that's one thing that I, I think we discuss here in a little bit later in the, the program, but um, a SID requires a clearance. You can't fly a SID unless you've been told by ATC specifically to fly that SID. An ODP, on the other hand, does not require a clearance, and you can just go out and fly an ODP without a clearance from ATC, and that's totally acceptable. Yep. So would... would... ODP be more for VFR flight? No, nope, both of these are geared towards IFR flying. There's nothing wrong with flying an ODP if you're a, a VFR airplane because, like we talked about, it guarantees terrain clearance. Um, but they're they're more tailored towards IFR flying, where if you're in instrument conditions, you're in a cloud and you you don't know where any terrain is. Flying okay. this procedure guarantees that you'll stay clear of it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um. So. Uh, let's go back to talking about standard instrument departures or SIDS. Uh, these can be further broken down into a number of categories. There's two main ones that we're going to talk about. So the first is vectored, and the second is pilot navigation. Um, so with a vector departure, for example, in this case, we have the Logan 2 departure out of Boston Logan. You're going to fly some combination that will, or some procedure that's going to get you on an initial heading. In a number of cases out of Boston, that's runway heading, but there are a couple exceptions, such as departing runway 22 right or 22 left. But you're going to fly on that heading, and you'll receive further vectors from the Boston departure controller who's going to vector you to your first fix, right? Whatever that is, SOX, Blazer, REVs, whatever the case is. Um, the common other one is pilot navigation, which basically is saying from the moment that you take off on the runway, that you, you start climbing, um, you're navigating yourself. So you're following a set point of fixes or radials or something that's going to get you on course without further intervention from air traffic control. Um, depending on the specific procedure, some could require RNAV capability. 
Um, so GPS or INS or some form of, of area navigation um, that is not available if your plane only has VOR or NDB uh, based navigation. And then we're going to now let's talk about a radar vector departure. So the way that you know one is it will state expect radar vectors to assign route slash navigate slash fix, etc. Uh, you follow the assigned course or heading until you're given vectors. So if you can see here on the Logan 2, if you're a jet aircraft, it gives you certain headings to fly and it all off certain runways. And then it says thence dot 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 expect radar vectors to assign route. Non-jet aircraft, you're not going to fly your own heading initially. You're just going to get a heading right off the bat from air traffic control to fly. But the whole point here is at some point in the departure, you are getting radar vectored to your initial fix from air traffic control. And what that means from a practical perspective, when you're on one of these radar vector departures and you're flying the assigned heading, you do not turn on course until you actually get that instruction, proceed direct glide or turn right direct glide, resume on navigation. We see that also quite frequently on VATSIM. A pilot requests the clearance, we assign them the Bangor 1 departure, or let's use the Logan 2 departure here. They turn left to the 140 heading, and then immediately they just keep on turning direct to their first waypoint. Again, that's the incorrect procedure. The Logan 2 or any other radar vector departure means you're going to fly the assigned heading, and at a point later on down the line, air traffic control is going to give you a clearance to proceed on course. And there was a question and, in the chat. Um, uh, go ahead, Krieg, or were you going to answer that? Well, two things. I, I was going to answer it, although I had one other point first. Uh, the first thing I was going to say was even if you're on a radar vector departure, such as the Logan, it's very important that you actually look at the departure. Um, most people assume that if you're on a departure such as the Logan, that you're just flying runway heading. And that's not always the case. For example, if you look at the departure route description off of runway 22 left and 22 right, it says a climbing left turn to 140 degrees, then uh, radar vectors to assign route navigate fix. So it's not always runway heading. Uh, in a lot of cases, you'll get a different heading. In some cases, for example, departing runway 27, you climb on a heading to a certain distance, 2.2 miles from the Boston VOR in this case, and then a left turn to 235. So those instructions can change, and it's important that you you read those um, uh, descriptions or departure procedures uh carefully. The other thing, Joel asked, if a controller clues you for takeoff with a heading other than runway heading, what exactly should you, uh, when, sorry, should you turn to that assigned heading? And that's a great question. Um, generally speaking, if a, an air traffic controller gives you a heading in a takeoff clearance, that supersedes anything that you've been given previously. So you're going to fly runway heading to 400 feet above ground level, so airport elevation plus 400 feet, and then turn to fly whatever heading the air traffic controller just assigned you. But that heading that you get assigned during in a takeoff clearance, overrides a SID, it overrides your clearance that you received from clearance delivery um, and anything that you received before it. Good question. So here we have a pilot navigation departure. Um, in this case, we're looking at the Blazer 4 departure off of Boston Logan. Um, and as you can see from the runway, depending on what runway you're departing, there's a whole course and um, a specific set of waypoints that you have to follow, um, but you're navigating that as the pilot. You're not receiving instructions from air traffic control because you're flying that lateral portion uh, manually. So for example, if we're departing runway 22 right, which is a common departure runway at Boston, you're going to climb on heading 215 to intercept course 143 to TJ. Do not exceed 210 knots until 520 feet above sea level. And then on the depicted route to Blazer. So we're going to look over here. There's our 215. There's our 143 course to TJ. Then we would go direct uh, Barrow, direct Jate, direct Hemo, direct Kenwe, and then direct Blazer. So there's a combination of having to look at the textual description as well as this uh, uh, pictorial description over here. Um, it, but essentially, in most of our planes, you're going to engage navigation mode or LNAV or whatever that airplane has to track that course that you programmed into the FMS or GPS. Uh, if you go to the BVA or TCC.com slash RNAV webpage, there's an additional description and briefing on flying RNAV departures that goes a little bit more in depth of, of what we've covered today. Now we're going to talk about different elements of a SID. So here we have the Bangor 3 departure up top. That's going to be the SID name and the version. So whenever you're briefing with another pilot, you want to make sure that you're on the same version of the departure. 
um, so that you're both on the same uh, updated plate. Next, you have the top altitude. That is the altitude um, air traffic control instruction, notwithstanding that you, cli uh, that you climb to initially off of the runway. So if you're cleared via the Bangor 3 departure, you initially climb to and maintain 1-0-10,000. And, and this is particularly important for VATSIM operations that you find that initial departure. If you receive a clearance that says climb via SID, the controller is expecting you to look at the chart and figure out whatever the top altitude it is. So when you take off, you can go ahead and climb up to that altitude, but no more. That's, that's the highest altitude you're allowed to climb without a further clearance. Um, and especially on VATSIM, that can cause a lot of problems if you go above that altitude. Do you have to stick to that altitude or can you be below it? Um, if... Uh, what's the second half of your question? Uh, can it be below that altitude, or you have to stick to ten thousand uh, to one zero ten thousand? So if uh, if you it, it depends on what you filed. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Alec. Uh, I, I was just going to say it depends on what you filed because if you look at the very bottom of the plate, it says maintain one zero thousand or requested altitude if lower or as assigned by air traffic control. So okay. ATC will tell you what you expect. If you're let's say expecting, let's say you filed three four zero and you're cleared via the Bangor 3, you maintain 10,000 until you get cleared higher. If you filed 6,000, you maintain 6,000. Okay. And you, in the scenario where you filed 6,000, your clearance would actually have the words maintain 6,000 in it. So you'd be very sure about what altitude to climb to. In the scenario where we have a what's called climb via SID, which was what we used on some of the RNAV departures out of Boston, again, your top altitude is going to be 5,000 there, and pretty rarely would you be flying at a lower altitude than that anyway. If you're ever unsure, so let's say you filed 6,000 and ATC just says climb via SID and the top altitude is 10,000 and you're not sure, should I go to 6,000 or 10,000? That's a great time to just ask that question and get some clarification. Then again, you and the controller are on the same page as far as what altitude you're going to go to. Okay. Next, we have a plan view of the procedure, um, which is kind of like a top-down view, quote-unquote, of the departure. So you depict the route that's going to be flown. So here we see uh, the initial departure off of the runway at Bangor, the available departure gates, which are the fixes that you are going to get radar vector to. Next, you have a textual description of the departure route, which will also mention the top altitude. That talks about... Um, for example, uh, take off off runway 15, you climb on a runway heading or 150, or as assigned by air traffic control, runway 33, you climb on a 330 heading or as assigned, and then uh, it'll go into you. Expect vectors to an assigned altitude and then gives you the whole uh, altitude to maintain. So here it's maintain 10,000 or requested altitude floor or as assigned by air traffic control. And then it also gives you an expect time. So expect clearance to filed altitude or level, flight level 10 minutes after departure. So that's very useful for lost comms. Let's say you um, take off out of Bangor and you lose uh, contact with air traffic control. You know that after 10 minutes, you climb to your assigned altitude. Then it also gives different takeoff minimums, which can be found in the TERPs if they are standard, and then notes. So here, for example, radar is required which means you need to be in contact with air traffic control in order to fly this departure. Uh, does anybody have any questions on this page? And as a note, the SID may be spread across multiple changes, so uh, particularly the bigger ones out of Boston, which have different transitions, you can, uh, those could even be two or three pages long, so be sure to check all of them. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about takeoff minimums. This is a little bit of a, a confusing topic, so so bear with me. Uh, published takeoff minimums can include a variety of things. They can include ceiling, so a, a lower cloud layer, uh, visibility requirements, as well as a specific climb gradient, which is usually expressed as an altitude per a certain distance. So, you know, 200 feet per nautical mile or something like that. Uh, published minimums may be found on ODPs or SIDS. Uh, they also may be found in the chart supplement. Uh, if no takeoff minimums are published, standard takeoff minimums uh, need to be uh, observed or met. So what are standard takeoff minimums? Well, uh, they encompass a couple of things. So first, you've got to cross the departure end of the runway at or above 35 feet AGL. So when you cross the other end of the runway, you need to be at or above 35 feet above the runway. From that point forward, you need to maintain a climb gradient of 200 feet per nautical mile up to the applicable minimum en route altitude. So for every mile that you go laterally, you must climb 200 feet. Um, so there's a number of little math 
calculations you can use to get a climb rate or something like that. They're usually performance charts or tables in the Terps. Um, but you need to be able to maintain that gradient, that angle, up until the minimum on route altitude. Um, you need to go straight ahead below 400 feet AGL. Um, that's a general thing. Like we talked about before, runway heading to 4,000 feet AGL is, is pretty standard. And then there's a visibility requirement. So for air carriers, uh, either airlines operating under FAR Part 121 or air carriers, charter carriers operating under FAR 135, um, if they have one or two engines, you need one mile visibility to take off. If you have three or, or more engines, uh, you need a half mile of visibility uh, in order to take off. For private operators, and this includes anybody operating under uh, FAR 91, even if it's like a, a 737 that your rich friend decided to buy, there are no minimums. You could legally take off in zero, zero visibility, right? Where you can't see ahead of you and the, there's no ceiling because it's the clouds are there. This is a little bit uh, crazy. Um, even though it's this is a good example of something that maybe it's legal, but it's not smart. Um, there's a reason that minimums exist for the higher carriers, right? The, the 121 and 135 guys. So that's probably something you want to think about if you're operating in the part 91 environment as well. Um, there's also spe special authorization, excuse me. So uh, air carriers can get authorization from the FAA to have lower than standard takeoff minimums. They're not published. You're going to find those in a company op spec or operating specifications, uh, but they can be low as a quarter mile for properly equipped aircraft. And for anybody on the channel who's flown in a quarter mile visibility, that's that's not a whole lot, right? You're, you're seeing a thousand feet down the runway. That's really not all that much. Can confirm. <laughs> yeah, and I'll say enough. for the sim pilot here, and actually for real pilots as well, air traffic control is really never going to enforce takeoff minimums. So we're not going to be there saying, ah, oh, you took off in three quarters of a mile visibility, mostly because we don't know what your minimums are. There are all kinds of different rules. As Krikor said, there are exceptions, and then there are exceptions to the exceptions. So it's not something that ATC is going to care about. I think what's important for the simulator pad here are those first three bullets under the takeoff minimums. Cross a departure in the runway at or above 35 feet AGL. Maintain 200 feet per nautical mile to the applicable safe altitude. And if you're given a turn, you're only turning at 400 feet AGL or higher. If you meet those three criteria at an airport where there is no obstacle departure procedure, which is, comes back to that question we had asked earlier, now you're safe. You can turn any direction. And if the airport doesn't have an ODP and it does have an instrument approach, the FAA has assessed it, saying at 400 feet, as long as you keep on climbing at that 200-foot rate, you're safe to go anywhere you want. And if there is an obstruction that would affect that, that'll be clarified on an obstacle departure procedure. Or if you've been given a clearance and are following a standard instrument departure or SID, your SID will also provide you with that same obstacle clearance, provided that those three criteria get met. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, Evan. Thank you. And and for anybody here who's a, a actual pilot and has instrument experience or instrument ratings, uh, if you're confused about any of this, I, I would encourage you to speak with a, a CFI or a double I, or I'm sure Alec and I would be happy to discuss it, uh, but to get into this stuff a little bit more in depth, just because there are no requirements for you to take off as a, a small airplane under Part 91 doesn't mean that's smart or safe. There's a reason these things exist. This is a great example of, of something that's not required, but it's safe. Okay, so we talked about SIDS and ODPs, but what happens if there's no departure procedure at the airport that you're departing? Well, there are several ways you can be instructed to. First, at a controlled airport, you can ask, you can expect the tower controller or occasionally even the delivery controller to ex give you a, a runway head or um, a heading assignment, either runway heading or a uh, turn off of the runway. So if there's no SID or ODP, expect that. Uncontrolled airport gets a little bit trickier. If you're cleared, quote unquote, as filed from an uncontrolled airport, you proceed to the first flight plan on the point on your own, and you are responsible for your own obstacle clearance here. That's not on air traffic control. That's on you to maintain obstacle clearance in whatever way uh, you deem appropriate. If you are cleared to enter controlled airspace on a specific heading, uh, for example, once you're in class echo airspace, so either 700 or 1200 uh, feet, depending on where you are, or occasionally even down at the surface, uh, fly the assigned heading. You will receive further instructions after getting in contact with air traffic control again, and you are still responsible for your own terrain and obstacle clearance until air traffic control gives you a new radar vector when you are told you are in radar contact with them. Uh, if you are at an airport with an instrument approach, 
and no ODP published uh, for terrain and obstacle clearance. Uh, it's assured for any direction if you cross the departure end at or above 35 feet. You climb to 400 feet above the ground before making any turns. And you climb at the standard climb rate of 200 feet per nautical mile to a safe altitude and reach the safe altitude within 25 miles of the airport or if it's a designated mountainous area, for whatever reason, FAA picked 46 nautical miles. <laughs> and, and that's really that, that second point there, that uh, untowered airport with an instrument approach, that's really important. Um, the whole point of flying IFR is that even if you can't see anything, you're in a cloud, you can see five feet in front of you and that's it, you know you're not going to hit anything. That's the entire point of flying IFR is you're safe from terrain, you're safe from other airplanes. Um, so if you do those three things, you cross the runway at or above 35 feet, you may climb to 400 feet AGL before making any turns, and you maintain a 200 foot per nautical mile climb gradient, you know you are safe. So that that's a very important point right there. Any questions on the slide? Okay. So let's talk bigger picture what you need to fly IFR. Uh, the, the first is to find and file a route. There's a couple different sources like we talked about that are available. Skyvector is a good one, flightplan.com, flightaware, and the FAA preferred route database. All of these are going to give you different routes. And depending on what, you're, what type of plane you're flying, where specifically you're flying, you may get different routes or one source may have a route while the other ones don't. So it's important that you look through them to try and find something that looks like a, a valid route for you. Um, you need to select an appropriate altitude. So if you're heading eastbound, and this is the magnetic course from your air des uh, departure airport to your destination airport, if it's eastbound between uh, 360 degrees and 179 degrees magnetic, um, you need an odd altitude. So 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, flight level 350, et cetera. Uh, if it's westbound, so 180 through 359 magnetic, an even thousand, so 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, flight level 340, et cetera. Um, you'll generally hear this abbreviated as NEOD SWEVEN, so northeast. If it's north or east, it's odd. If it's south or west, it's even. Uh, you need to request an IFR clearance, so you can't operate under IFR until you've requested the clearance. And similarly, you need to, oops, uh, you need to um, receive a clearance, read it back, and comply with it. So that clearance from ATC is a promise to you that, hey, if you do what we say, you'll be safe, and, and everything will, you know, you'll, you'll be clear of terrain, you'll be clear of other airplanes, etc. So you need to read it back so that they know that you're following it, and then you need to actually comply with it. Now let's talk about how to get an IFR clearance. They follow the same set of pattern of five elements, which we did talk about in an earlier uh, ground school, but we're going to touch on again today and use the acronym CRAFT. Clearance limit, this is the almost always the destination airport. Route of flight is the route of, that you will fly. Altitude, this is composed of an initial climb and final climb altitudes or phraseology like climb via SID. So sometimes the final climb altitude is already included in the departure that you're given. Departure frequency is the radar facility that'll handle you after you take off. And then the transponder is the tra code you input into your transponder for the flight. That should be pretty straightforward. Example. Clear to the Chicago O'Hare Airport via the Albany 7 departure. Radar vector Syracuse Van As filed. Maintain 10,000. I'm assuming that's a typo. Maintain 10,000. Departure frequency 134.7. Squawk 3 or uh, tree 113. Um, okay, so reroutes are a pretty large part of flying in the IFR environment. Um, you can receive these for, for during a number of portions during the flight. So uh, on your initial call for IFR clearance, ATC may modify a route, or they could change just the SID portion of your route. Um, this could be because of traffic. It could be because of noise abatement. Uh, there could be a preferred route between your departure and your destination. Uh, there could be navigational outages, so a, a VOR that's out of service or something like that, or, or a variety of other uh issues or if you're flying in new york because they feel like it yeah <laughs> you're not wrong about that <laughs> um as as we talked about earlier if if you um if you can't fly it don't accept it uh if you read back a clearance and you say yeah we're cleared to norwood via victor 431 madison victor whatever if, if you can't actually do that don't read it back because now the controller thinks you're going to do it. So if you mess up, they're going to get mad at you. If you say, hey, we're not able to find Victor 475, so can we get rid of Victors? They may be frustrated, but at least they know what you're doing and they're able to work with you a little bit. Um, so if you do receive a reroute, whether it's on the ground or in the air, um, they're going to read out the new route and they should spell everything out phonetically. So in the example here, 
you cleared up, you know, uh, whatever. Via the Logan to departure, Raider Vectors Manchester, Mike Hotel Tango, Direct Syracuse, Sierra Yankee Romeo, and then that's filed. So they'll, they'll read everything out and they'll spell it for you. So even if you don't know what Syracuse is, you know what to plug into your FMS or GPS or whatever. Um, if you just receive a new SID, um, they will, they'll assign it in your clearance the same way they would with a reroute. And if you read it back, you're accepting it. And if you're not able to fly it, you need to tell them, oh, we're unable to Logan to departure. So they may say cleared up, you know, whatever, Logan to departure, Raider Vectors, Bow Sox, then has filed. Any questions with that? So IFR clearance procedures. Uh, find and file your flight plan, um, either on VATS, and this is done through a number of sources, in either the pilot or through pre-file, uh, include a SID, or if you don't, um, air traffic control will assign one if one is required. Have a pen and paper ready, that's really important. Call the approach control and request an IFR clearance, uh, write down the elements of the clearance, and pay close attention to any changes in the routing or a SID that may be assigned, because uh, sometimes you some SIDs are runway dependent. Uh, read back the clearance in full unless you have a question. Always have a question answered before reading back clearance. Uh, and then verify that you can comply with all elements of the clearance, including the SID, so takeoff minimums, climb performance, aircraft type restrictions, navigation capabilities, and all that jazz. The assigned routing and altitude to make sure that um, that you, air traffic control didn't give you a route that's going to the wrong airport, which is rare but does happen, or that you are even capable of flying the route that you were assigned. And most importantly, key takeaway here, if you have a question or are unable to comply or just don't know something, please ask air traffic control. It is so much easier to get a situation sorted on the ground than 1,000 feet above the ground just after rotation when you don't know where to go. Any questions on this? All right, so clearance shorthand. So uh, this kind of delves into a recommended shorthand for writing down a clearance so that you can abbreviate, you know, it's hard to write down every single word. So it makes it a little bit easier if there's a, a shorthanded way of writing everything down. With that being said, the, the way the FAA writes this, at least in this slide, can be somewhat confusing because you're effectively having to memorize something. So I'm not going to recommend that you use this specific shorthand procedure, but I recommend that you come up with something. So for example, you know that an IFR clearance is going to follow that CRAFT acronym, at least in some form. It's going to have all five of those components. So take a piece of paper, write out C-R-A-F-T, right, vertically, and then find some sort of uh, some sort of shorthand um, for all of those elements. Some of this is useful, right? RV for radar vectors, for example, is a pretty common abbreviation. That's something that's easy to understand. But generally speaking, try and find some sort of shorthand that works for you. Every major clearance, especially an IFR clearance, you should be writing it down and having a record of it. It makes sure that you read it back correctly, and it makes sure that you don't forget anything, which is, it sounds silly, but it's really easy to forget something. And then if you go and make it up, then you know, you're know you probably gonna make a mistake. So have some way of writing it down in a, a shorthanded form, whatever works for you. If you like this FAA form, then use the FAA form. But if you don't like it, don't use that. Don't force yourself to memorize something that isn't gonna work for you. Um, it's hard to write down things like heading and altitude because they're kind of, quick and monotonous and you can just you know plug it into the airplane and reference it there um but for big things like an ifr clearance or a mid-air reroute or something like that having a shorthand to write it down is really really helpful yeah again uh just find a system that works i wouldn't necessarily come with the fa one but whatever you have and find that works it's important that you do have one all right let's talk about helicopters in the IFR world, helicopters are treated almost exactly the same as fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, so especially when you're operating to and from runways, you can be cleared via a SID to take off on a specific heading and for an instrument approach. Uh, however, SIDs uh, can and often do have restrictions such as turbojet aircraft only. And to expedite departure, you can consider requesting a VFR departure or a VFR climb if the weather is so permissible. All right, and so that's pretty much it for uh, for for IFR clearances today, and kind of our introduction to um, uh, instrument procedures. I hope you guys have enjoyed it all. Uh, we'll stay around. We'll stick around for a couple minutes to answer any questions that you may have uh, pertaining to IFR navigation. But we hope you'll join us next week for uh, our ground school on oceanic procedures, where we're going to talk about 
what you do if you're going over the North Atlantic or, or some other large oceanic airspace. Um, if you found this instrument procedures ground helpful, or you're interested in, in furthering your instrument knowledge, uh, we're talking about holds in two weeks, which is a complicated instrument procedure, followed by two classes on approach procedures, and a third, or rather a fourth class on RNAV, or area navigation. So we're gonna get a little bit more involved in some of these topics. If it's something you're interested in learning more about, we hope you guys decide to join us uh, for those future ground school lessons.